Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Tailgating with Geniuses long chair conversations with incredibly smart people from the world of business, media, sports, entertainment, and anything else that touches your life and is making money for somebody. Uh, hopefully you. I'm one of your very tolerable, hopefully, co-hosts. I'm Ken Schmidt, and joined as always is Martin Flaherty, me. I want to get the, in front of that. I'm very excited Atlanta, about Georgia. Georgia. He's Well, he's always excited, folks. You know that about Martin. And we are joined today, if you are watching this in video format, instead of listening to it, you see a third face, uh, by a very, very special guest today who more than fits the moniker of extremely smart people from the world of business, Mr. Jeff DeVito. Now, now Jeff, before I, I do a more formal type introduction, I would just say to our listeners that if, as a result of you know checking out the show, you went and looked up Jeff on LinkedIn, and you would say he's listed as the enrichment lead at Explore Journeys, which is a brand new luxury cruise line that, uh, correct me if I'm misrepresenting the business here, has, has little in common with the massive cruise ships that we're all familiar with. Uh, but what's really got our attention about Jeff is that one of the things that Martin and I talk about the most and complain about the most when we're either commiserating or working with our clients is this whole issue of customer experience and why it's become such a ridiculously difficult thing for businesses to deliver, despite the fact that everybody's aware that they need to be focusing on that. And we got our attention about Jeff is that he takes the subject of customer experience to a very scientific level because he's an anthropologist first uh, and a studier of human behavior and how these things impact customer experience in organizations large and small. He's got over 25 years of experience doing this uh, at very, very high levels in the hospitality industry. And I have to believe that there is no other industry in the world that virtually any business can't learn from when it comes to delivering customer experience than hospitality. So, Jeff, welcome to Tailgating with Geniuses. I'll, I'll get you a hat. Thank you. I certainly need a hat right now after that. Yeah. Although I th- worry that my head's going to be too big after your great introduction. Thank you. Thank you very there, much. It's great to be here with such distinguished hosts. Um, well, we'll, we'll um, ruin that for you real quick. <laughs> In a heartbeat. All right. So, so, so Jeff, I want to start immediately because I'm always fascinated. Like, uh, let's not do the full journey, but I love it when we get someone on board with us and they're doing a particular role, but how they trained themselves or what they studied is so in- seeming incredibly different from the role itself. You're an anthropologist, okay? So explain to us how an anthropologist gets to luxury cruises or high level of experiential design, and then what are you, how are you taking that learning and applying it to, to your work? Thank you. That's that's very very interesting. The joke that I made for a long time when someone said, you know, what what are you going to do with an anthropology degree? Uh, I said I'm going to be an excellent waiter, and that was sort of in the response to people saying, yeah, I mean, it's people saying, you know, what are you going to do with that useless degree? And then I became a waiter after college, um, and you know, I've been working in hotels, luxury hotels during college as a cabana boy. But I became a waiter, and suddenly the joke wasn't funny. And someone said, oh, what are you doing as a waiter? And I said, well, I'm an anthropologist. And then over time, I started to realize that there's no hierarchy and nobility of craft when you need to make a buck, right? And so I started through being a waiter and through working in hospitality and working at hotels as summer jobs just because I didn't know what to do with myself. I found that was actually the entry point to wanting to study more about anthropology and then wanting to apply an anthropological gaze to the world of hospitality. And once that door opened, I realized I never had an escape plan to get out of either hospitality or anthropology. They're just things that you, I don't want to say you're born with because they both have to be trained, but they're things that are very personal and and in your heart and in your soul and in your spirit. And so that's how they all fit together. And so after a number of stints working at hotels, resorts, whether it was up at Chatham Bars Inn in, in Cape Cod in, in college or down at uh, Sawgrass Marriott down in Florida or on all these different cruise ships, I kept coming back to anthropology. And anthropology for me was a way of understanding the world. And then you start talking about the nobility of the guest. 
And then he started talking about the nobility of the host. And you look at host guest relationships all over the world and how do you deliver an experience to someone? And it's got to be through a balance. It's got to be through can, an exchange. Can, can I ask you first, uh, can you, because you're an anthropologist, and this is the, the, the air that you breathe every day, can you go to visit a business, do business online with somebody, uh, you know, enter a hotel, enter a store somewhere where you're not constantly looking at, you know, doing a behavioral study. Why are these people doing this the way that they're, they're doing this? Are you able to shut that off or because it's always turned on? Do you see some really common threads in all these businesses where geez, people are making some really obvious mistakes? So when we talk about that, you don't turn it off. And I have traveled more than, you know, a lot of people. I've been very fortunate to visit places all over the world that were only parts of this old wall map I used to have as a kid. They used to sort of scratch off and pull at the seam of the equator and try to rip the equator down. And all these places, you know, like Mali or Burkina Faso or Laos or whatever it is, all became places I visited. And so as I started to combine more of the anthropological world with the travel world, Travel became incredibly interesting and exciting for me, but not the people I was traveling with. Because I would always analyze whatever the situation was. I'd look at it, I'd look at everything as how is this an opportunity for a tour guide? How can I capture this experience and share this with 40 other people? How can I take the story that the taxi driver is telling me about a hurricane that just happened on an island? And how can we get that guy in front of a hundred people a week? And so there's this evaluation, and there's also a mechanical opportunity that you see in all. But rather than look at the mistakes, I, I look and I celebrate, I see the mistakes and I can list them off left, right, and center. But I started to see the positives and what people were doing right in hospitality. And that's when you started to understand where management has different opportunities than perhaps they realize because they don't necessarily see the small picture. We get so tied up with the big picture that we don't realize the small human connections. And I think that's where the anthropological gaze comes in. So, so Jeff, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that um, Ken and I do is, is when we do our training, the torque sessions uh, that we do with leadership, you know, inevitably you need to tell stories of firms that have done it well. And then of course, there's always those classic examples of people messing things up. And in the hospitality world, one of my favorite, sort of collection of a ton of information, data, process, training, learning is distilled into a single sentence. And, and we, we talk about this pretty extensively, but famously, Ritz Carlton has this marvelous expression, which is ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And it is a it is sort of their guidepost phrase that they used, which is there's civility in it. There's there's empathy in it. There's uh, ethic, ethics built into that statement and parity in it as well. There's a high level of respect in that statement. And I find that really interesting in that um, here's a corporation in hospitality that is working specifically on making sure their employees and their guests have a level of maybe parody is not right because you famously did that wonderful TEDx talk at Clerkenwell where you talk about we're all in the same boat and how actually that's not quite true. Sorry, I'm doing some ancient history on you, but um, how, how do, does a company sort of create and distill a set of behaviors and actually start systematizing without being robots, a way in which service can be delivered and then affinity can be built with the client because that's what great hospitality organizations do. That's, I mean, that's the big question is what makes one hospitality provider better than the other? And Ritz Carlton, wonderful organization. I mean, they, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen, great, wonderful presence. It makes me as a customer feel like there's some, some parity, as you said. It makes me want to go work for a company that values me. But when it actually comes down to me as a server serving you as the customer, is there really par? What if, what if I put too much cream in your coffee that you just paid $19 for? What if your, uh, what if your lobster thermidor really tastes like clam chowder? You know, when someone, when there's a mistake, how long do you remain a gentleman in this conversation and how much par is there? And there's always a transaction. 
And so the trick in hospitality is to figure out how within the parameters and the ideals of an organization, within the guardrails, the individual has the freedom to show their own personality, to connect with you, or to know when to pull back and not connect to you. So you have to train people and empower people to understand how much a customer wants to engage. And you need to give your employees, your teammates, the guidance to let them know where these rails are. And that's what it is, because it's not, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. It's a great catchphrase. It's beautiful. And I applaud Ritz Carlton for, for coming up with that. I mean, it's just so good, but does it do what it says in the box? Yeah. If you take a survey of people that work for Ritz Carlton, they're probably pretty happy because they know they're at the top, but they're also serving people that are at a different top. You know, how much are you talking to your caddy after a golf game about other stuff? How often does someone say, oh, that waiter was great. Let's offer him a job. Here's my business card. That guy goes home thinking, oh, great. I'm going to go work for Miramax. They call it Miramax, and that's just done. How many times are you with someone, a bartender, <laughs> is with someone, you get a few pops in, and next thing you know, you're getting promised the world. You know, there's, there's a lot in there. And so in hospitality, you can become jaded by the idea that there's parity. But it's about a manager giving the employee the confidence to be able to connect. And I think that's what that's where it comes to. That's where, where you really can be. And knowing when that transaction is over, when that episode is over. I have a great, great story about that for later. And what I say, and I want to see if you agree or disagree with this, that, that really all customer experience is, is what the customer remembers. And we remember things either really positively about this, company that I was just exposed to, uh, which is rare. We experienced that business negatively. Our memory, you know, they left us on hold for 10 minutes or they were rude or brusque. Uh, but there's that huge chasm of transactional stuff in the middle that probably 80 to 85% of all business dealings that we have that are completely non-memorable because nothing happened. Nobody did anything beyond what we expected. And you spoke of management empowering their their people to focus on uh, you know, being empathetic, to delivering a great experience, to you know, to being rich and human and engaging. Uh, how do we formalize that in a business? How do we make that real, other than just you know, kind of cheerleading for it from the top? What should leaders expect of their of their people? Well, first of all. The experiences that are good are the ones you remember, but oftentimes the best experiences are the one you, ones you forget. And I'm not talking about you know doing keg stands in college, but experiences that can remove you from the stress of your world for a moment, that's luxury. The experiences that you have that make you forget whatever else that noise is. There's so much of an emphasis on meditation these days and being presence and mindfulness. And if in, well, let's go back to the transaction of serving a cup of coffee. If I can give you a cup of coffee that's so good that you forget about the fact that you stepped in a puddle coming into the coffee shop or that you don't like whatever music's on or that you're so stressed about whatever's happening in your life, that moment of bliss that makes you forget, that makes you present, you may not leave the coffee shop and say, and be able to articulate it, but you remember that you went there and you can't put your finger on it. So that, that's one thing that I think is important. Mm -hmm. we, we spend so much time about making memories when we should spend time creating presence. Then if every company is asking how they do this, they're missing the question. The first question is, why do you want to do this? Is this important for your business? Why is this important to your business? And why isn't this part of your business anyway? What foundation did you not, what stones did you not have in your foundation to begin with? So much about empowering people is about letting them think or know that they're driving that personal experience. I can look at a bunch of comment cards in my cruise industry or hotel work. And I can find fault with all sorts of transactions that people have had in interactions, but I'm not there. 
I don't know what it is. I can't call someone into the office and say, hey, man, what happened here? Why did you do this? I can say, hey, what what happened? Like, let me let me hear from you what happened. Um, there's this old saying that's common in hospitality when someone says, hey, how's, how's, it, how's it going out there? And you say, oh, it'd be great here at the beach if it wasn't for all these customers. I had a captain that uh, was hanging out with having a soda pop one day and this guy's crew member walked by and the captain said, Hey, how's your day? And the guy said, Oh, it sure be great if it wasn't for all these customers. And he laughed. The captain took him aside and he said, I think you're joking. But if I ever hear you say that again, there's a plank out back because we're in this business <laughs> because of these customers and for these customers. If you don't like it, I got another job for you. Yeah. So why do we need to have these moments? Why, what in customer experience, what in experiential moments, you have to ask yourself why you're going to do it before you spend the time putting it into play or trying to figure it out. Because it doesn't have to happen everywhere, but it can happen everywhere. And it's a zero cost part of business. That's the other thing. But I have had recently so many utterly abysmal experiences flying that have nothing to do with you know the physical aircraft or getting from point a to point b and nothing to do with uh you know things that happen you know service issues or whatever or weather uh it's dealings with people that have been brusque that have been uh coldly mechanical that have literally like just turned their back to me and you can you can literally hear like the the displeasure coming from them as I'm bringing them something that they should be able to, you know, problem that they should be able to solve for me rather quickly, you know, not even withstanding all my status with the airlines. And I always walk away going like, like, why is that tolerated? I mean, somebody here knows that they're talking to, they're talking to the people who are paying their salaries, right? The, 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 The customer on the beach. Why are we not being more gracious, empathetic when there's a, a problem. And is that, is that, I know it's a quote, you know, trainable thing, but it gets back to the why, if that employee doesn't know why they should be doing that, they're not doing it. So like, wh- where's the disconnect there between well, let's, them and the desire to, to, to be more human and rich and empathetic? And let me throw this the other way. Let me, let me turn this one around. Ladies, let's go back to ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. You've also got to be the gentleman. So which you're going to be hard for him. Which oh, is, this, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the <laughs> nicest guy in the world. I don't know. So. Maybe you're still dressed up from Halloween. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> you know, here, here's the thing. You're, you're walking through TSA, right? We all, we all do that. You're in the, you've got clear, you got TSA pre, you've got like everything under, under the sun to help you get through. You're flying in first class. You got everything. And there's some guy in front of you who just lets the TSA guy have it. We all know the rules. Take your stuff out of your pockets so that you have to take the stuff that you don't. We're in these lanes because we want efficiency. It's not because we necessarily want privilege. We just want to get through and get in and get our drink, get our, get our thing of macaroni and cheese from the Admiral's Club that day. You know, remember, have that conversation you have once a week with the guy in Charlotte at the bar. You know, whatever, whatever it is. But you just see this guy letting the TSA guy have it. Then he's sitting next to you in the Admiral's Club. You're both getting a drink. You get yours. You're like, oh, this is great. And the guy looks over. He complains about it. He gives some lip to the person. You see the guy doesn't tip. You know, whatever it is. He's talking a big, oh, I'll get you next time. I don't have any cash. You get on the airplane. This guy's sitting next to you. The person that comes to say, how's your day on the airplane, gets a bunch of abuse from this guy. And you're sitting there in the other seat. What do you do? Now, imagine... You get on an airplane, you haven't had this experience with this guy. There's no one next to you. And you get a cold shoulder from the person that's offering you a beverage or they don't, or you're used to getting two bottles of Woodford and they give you one or whatever it is. It's on you at this point to turn that interaction around. If you want it to be on par, you turn it around. You can't look at it as this person's salary depends on treating me well. You've got to turn it around as I don't know what happened to them. Maybe their husband cheated on him last night. Maybe their wife, you know, has a medical condition that's there. You never know what's on the other side. So if you really want to create par, 
you got to give someone an opening. That's where you got to smile back. Yeah, but it's totally real. I mean, like a lot of the time, like I'll sit in a group of like, so a lot of the work I've done, Jeff, in the past is and still do this on sustainability. And I'll sit there and I'll say to people, it's like, okay, so, so tell me, and I'm sitting with execs. And I said, and by the way, I do not get invited back a lot of times because <laughs> I say stuff like, okay, so who had a family you grew up with? You didn't grow up rich and a bunch of hands go up. And I said, so who had a Christmas gift or a Hanukkah gift, something that was given. And then you knew the family extended beyond their means to go ahead and get it for you. A bunch of hands go up and said, was it okay and cool to break that gift and then throw it in the trash? Nobody raises a hand. And I said, so who was ever allowed at a plate to take as much food as you want, take two bites and throw it out? Nobody responds. And I said, so at what particular point does it become okay that we're allowed to waste, throw stuff into landfill, create all these other different things? And, and can I'll go back to the fact that at a certain point in our lives, professionally, we give ourselves permission to just basically be assholes. Sorry, folks, for those listening. Um, but like we we do. And and I really have a hard time. I've worked as a waiter. I've worked as a bartender. I've worked as a DJ. I did all that stuff early on. And that was just last weekend. <laughs> people can be awful. How important and how do you use the environment to sort of convey a high level of experience to people without having the biggest budget in the world like what's your take on the physical environment creating the experience that you want people to have have you uh you flown into singapore airport no uh, have you ken by chance yes yeah yes so and you've flown into dullas right yes. <laughs> all the time you've flown into miami so yes. your first impression when you come into a lot of american airports is you have very low ceilings you have very, very bright uh, lights. You feel from the moment that you walk in there that you've done something wrong, that you're guilty, and you feel that it's pressure. <laughs> when you walk into Singapore, which there's far more reasons that you're guilty going into Singapore than when you're going into San Francisco, I'll tell you, man. Got lucky on that one a few times. But you walk in, and instead of this low ceiling, you're in an atrium that opens up that is 10, 15 times the height that you are. And there's palm trees in there and the lines are spread out a little bit and there's some rock water feature or something. And you get off the plane and you're instantly relaxed because you have space and you have the right lighting and the noise is diffused. And so a free thing that you can do in hospitality is adjust your lighting. You can change the tone of your lighting, regardless of the space that you have, to make people feel warm or to make people feel nervous. Now, the challenge is not everybody responds the same way to ceiling lights versus other lamps. There's safety concerns. There's all of this. But one of the best ways that you can change things physically is with lighting. The second thing, if you're an architect, is you have high ceilings and you have space per person that exceeds the expectation of what that space might be in a different environment. So if you walk into a grocery store, the higher the ceilings are in the grocery store, you almost feel like it's not as crowded when you're standing in line. When you're, when you're compressed in space, so a double-decker train, a double-decker bus always feels more empty than a single-decker bus, even though it's the exact same proportions. And you feel a little bit freer because they have those big windows around the front if you're going through London. So what you can do architecturally to make people feel like they're in luxury and to feel good is have more space. Space is a luxury. I mean, we know that. Those of us that got had the privilege to do COVID out in the woods versus in a 20-story apartment block somewhere, we know how valuable space is to mental health. So that's one of the things you can do. So there's a duality. So so customer, you know, the experience training with your employees and making sure people are aligned with their brand, what you're trying to accomplish, what you want people to do, but then also making sure the physical environment where you put your customers in is meets sort of the physical needs that they have or those experiences and the way we psychologically react to things. It's a marriage of those two things. Can I just jump on that? And, and, and I hope that, that every doctor in America, here's what Jeff just said, anyone in the medical profession, because of this one thing that I've noticed is that one of the consistently most 
uncomfortable, unpleasing environments as waiting areas uh, at a doctor's office. Uh, where there's you know posters on the wall that obviously came from the drug companies and you know the the, the human body it, it is a, is so awful, so cramped, so devoid of any effort to create a, a peaceful, relaxing environment, and you just nailed it right there. Is pay attention to space making and giving people that sense of comfort, especially when they're already going to be in an you know you're going to the doctor. Are you going to the dentist? Why not? So, Jeff, I want to ask you. I want to. I, I want to do something here, and I and I apologize. I encourage everyone to go to YouTube, find Jeff's information. We'll we'll post uh, the link. Do you mind if we post the link to the YouTube video you did? No, I and, was fifty pounds lighter well. back then. You know, just watch it with the sound down. <laughs> listen to the Grateful Dead. You know, hey, have, have, have a good time. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll do that. But one of the things that I love, you, you set up this con, you set up this idea, this idea that corporations and people love to say we're all in the same boat. And you unpack that and show that metaphorically and literally it can mean two entirely different things, that the experience is different. And you begin to take that model and then showcase customer experience. Uh, you, you go into a lot of different things. A lot of the dynamics that Ken and I were talking about, behavior, uh, the way people respond, what you're, what you're allowing to happen. But in a practical application, then you have a good bit of fun talking about how corporations put literally take people and put them in a boat going whitewater rafting. And I've laughed hysterically because I've talked to HR directors and people sort of very much off the record and said, so you all went to a ropes course somewhere. It's like, yes. And I said, a lot of people were wearing bad shorts and they're like, yes. And everyone had a helmet. And they're like, yes. And I said, somebody cried and they said, yes. And then so, and, I, and it's, it's, it's really, and then I asked the question and this is what I loved about what you did. I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm validating my own thinking, but they Always. pretty much tick the box over over like those characteristics of people walking into those experiences is either only highlighted or is just um, it remains the same throughout the experience. So it's not to take the Mickey out of like this type of desire to create cohesion in an organization for better experience and better um better management and better functionality. But what does a company do? Because before we went on air, I started looking at like, what are the recommended activities that these companies who offer these experiences? And I wrote them down. Uh, paintball, uh, escape rooms, trivia night, ice skating. And I'm like, no, these all sound terrible ideas. So, so how do you, as someone, an expert in anthropology, human thinking, and experience, how do you translate what could be done to a team to effectively do those things that they want to do? So these things that you want to do with a team, they have a very limited shelf life for how long they last. And that's what my TED Talk talks about is that very quickly, whatever the experience is, we resume the same roles that we had before. We saw this in COVID. There's this Right when we get locked down, there's this golden moment where everybody's working together in harmony. It's their Woodstock moment. And then very quickly, you run out of water, you run out of toilet paper. <laughs> you want to you go to a club, all these things. And very quickly, we come back with some of our roles more rigidly defined than they had been going into it. What a company can do most, I feel, when I try to do with the people that I work with, I ask them how they're doing. You give someone a talking stick, you know, that old thing we used to do when we were kids. You listen. My job is not listening. I talk all day long. But really, my job is to listen. Even if I'm not doing it sound-wise, I'm listening in the back of my head. What you can do the best for team building is find how people connect naturally and where they have similarities. Do you all like listening to Miles Davis? Do you all hate Miles Davis? Do you like beignets? What did your grandmother cook you when you were a kid, if, you have, if you're fortunate to have that? What's your comfort food? What's, what, do you, what would you rather be doing than this? How do we change the world? You ask questions to people. 
You get people to talk to you, and that's the best way to team build. Shooting someone in the face with a paintball or uh, making jokes about someone's nads coming out of those shorts on the rope course, that's a whole lot of fun. But all that does is reinforce the Lord of the Flies. And I'll tell you, Ken, to go back to that person that's cranky on the airplane, yeah. I'm going to tell you this. 95% of the time that you get bad service, it's because someone's boss just made their day difficult. Yeah, you never start off a shift telling someone that they're doing something wrong. You know, that's going to go right out there. You're going to create more problems. When you're on a ship and you're working with crew members who are living in completely different conditions than the millionaires that are buying this, this space, the worst thing you can do as a manager is give someone crap before they hit the floor. You've got to do everything you can to empathize with the fact that they're away from their home, that they are seeing people literally eating their day's salary at lunch. You have to do everything you can to give that person support to get through that very difficult day so that that way they can identify as a human with their guest. If you dehumanize them beforehand, if you give them, threaten them, if you tell them that if they don't do this, this happens. If you don't let them you know, have 10 minutes to call their girlfriend or their husband or whatever it is, that's wrong. So those are two answers there. But the thing that teams can do, team building is free. You just got to say, hey, how you doing? What's going on? And that's, that to me is, is the key. So, so, so if you are... Uh, you just started a business uh, and it's going to be a, we'll, we'll say it's hospital, restaurant, uh, a business, not industry now that is having a very difficult time attracting workers. And those of us that eat out a lot, we, we, you notice immediately, oh boy, they're either understaffed or this person hasn't been adequately trained and you kind of adjust your expectations accordingly and, you know, long for what it once was. But if, if you're starting a new business today and you've got your staff gathered, they're all sitting at the tables and, you know, opening days next week or whatever. What are you telling people in terms of, you know, both your expectations of them and what they should expect of you that's going to create that environment where they do feel empowered to, you know, be engaging and empathetic and understanding of the people that they're serving. I love to ask people that I work with all the time. I love to ask them over and over again. So what do you do here? What's your job? Why did you come to work here? Why did you want to do this? Why did you choose this over, over something else? Why did you come here? And people will give you all the reasons, the interview reasons. But man, I love it when someone says, because I need the bread. <laughs> I say, all right, cool. All right, good. At least like that guy's being honest. You know, that guy, none of us are, oh, because I want to connect with people or I have this love for Italian food or I really like sesame seeds on my hamburger bun. No, it's because you need some cash, man, right? <laughs> and when you got a team of people that are working for you and you started a restaurant, you have more empathy with those people than you know because they're going to make more money than you are for the first three months of that operation. You're putting everything you have in there. So how do you get on par with the people that you work with. And that's the big thing. You're not working for me, I'm not working for you. If we're not working together with a little bit of guidance and you know your roles, but if we're not working together, that's when the problems start. So what you do on that first day is you say, hey, in a week we're gonna open. Gosh, it's gonna be tough out there. I'm not gonna BS you about how much money you're gonna make. I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be easy. I'm not going to say, hey, we got a lot of pressure tonight. We got people in reviewing us. Let's just connect here for a minute on why we're here. Let's go around the room real quick. Tom, why, why are you doing this? Ah, oh, man, I'm sick of Red Lobster. All right, Patty, why are you doing this? You know, I got a job and this worked really well with my schedule. You know, Cynthia, how are you doing? Well, you know, I got to buy some skis at the end of the month, whatever it is. And then you say, great. And then you go back to that question a week later on opening night and you say, a week ago, you said this, you said this, you said this. I remember this as your boss. I remember why you're here. Anybody have any changes? And then at the end of that first night, 
you get everyone there, you say thank you, and you say, cool, is this still the right job for y'all? Do you still want to do this? You keep checking in. You keep making sure that you are there for your employee beyond just giving them a paycheck. And that's why there's a shortage of hospitality workers right now is because when COVID hit, the people that were waiters, the people that were bellmen, the people that were working in this sort of tip-based gig economy, until the government sorted it out, however they were going to get taken care of, they were lost. When those doors closed, a lot of those restauranteurs just said, forget it. I'm not talking to you for a year. And then after a year happened, we just expect you to come back and work for us and take a bunch of crap from people who have been pent up for a year and all of them with their different ideas of whether they're supposed to be wearing a mask or not and how vulnerable you are and the sexual harassment that came out of it. And so the workers in the hospitality industry said, wait a minute, you abandoned me. Why am I going back to work to make you rich? The companies that did well in the hospitality that does well out of COVID are the ones where there are points of contact between the owners the managers and the employees during this period of difficulty. And I saw companies, I saw restaurants that took care of their people. I saw restaurants that said, hey, you can't get any toilet paper. I got a Cisco guy that can't sell any toilet paper. Maybe we can figure out how this works. I saw people set up food banks where they let their employees buy at cost bulk materials. I saw people that set up training programs at home and said, I can't pay you. But when we come back to open, you're going to move up one position. Those are the places you want to go eat. You find out what they did during COVID, and then you decide where you're going to go for dinner. Well, Jeff DeVito, before we let you go, we want to bring have you join us in our last segment of what got your attention. But Jeff, is there anything that you can tell our listeners or you want to point them to to sort of get a bigger sense of what you're up to? publications, videos, anything like that, uh, so they can follow you a little bit more and, and hear more of this thinking or experience what it's like to see your work? Sure. So what I do for a job right now, which I love doing, and I can answer all these questions in ways that are going to take six or seven different episodes. What I do is I help people who travel in a luxury way, learn about the world around them and have them think while they're traveling and get a little deeper meaning and a deeper understanding into where they go. And my personal goal is that when people are finished with a travel experience, they come back home more compassionate than they started and that they understand the world they've seen and they start to take the main travel motivator for people say, whether they mean or not, is they go somewhere to learn about people, their customs, and to see how the rest of the world works. And we want them to bring that home with them. That's what I want people to do. So if I get you out on a cruise ship as a lecturer or get you out there as a customer, whatever it is, I want you both to come home having a better, more optimistic feeling about your neighbor. The way that people can follow me is to not follow me at all. The thing that they can do to learn about what I'm doing is start thinking about the transactions they have in their normal hospitality experiences, in their business, on the bus, look around, see how people are acting and see how you can make someone's life a little bit better. Because that's what hospitality is. It goes both ways. So that's that's what I would say. I mean, there's a thousand things that I get up to. I give talks to schools. I talk to businesses. I talk to bartenders a whole heck of a lot. You know, I have people who don't get along up to my house and try to sit around a campfire and break bread and talk about what we have in common. But the best thing you can do is to just keep looking and finding that optimism and that human connection and everything that you do. And it doesn't have to be lovey-dovey, but just stop for a second before you get mad at the person that's serving you or before you demand something. Quite, yeah. quite possibly one of my favorite plugs of all time. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is great. I mean, not my book, not my video. Come see me at, at, at Conference X. Thanks for doing this, man. Really appreciate you uh, you being here and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and sharing that information. There's some really solid stuff here. Thanks for that. But before we go, ladies Ooh. and gentlemen, uh, before we end it all, uh, let's go ahead and do what is what most folks really tune in for on the show. What got our attention this week? And to start, we're going to do with your favorite tolerable host, Ken Schmidt. Ken, what got your attention? What's got my attention uh, this week is how quickly I fell in love with Amanda Mull, 
a writer at the Atlantic uh, who put a story in the October 18th issue, go get it, that is not only in the sweet spot of what we're talking about today, but it's one of the major consistent pain points in my life, something that I revile and hate. As soon as I gave you the title of the article, you know exactly what the pain point is. It's called Self-Checkout is a Failed Experiment. (laughs) And the subhead, I love the subhead, it's please, not another unexpected item in the bagging area. Has a greater lie been foisted on the American (laughs) citizenry than self-checkout? Position to us as some, it's, it's a customer benefit that you get to take over uh, a role that an employee had previously done quite well, by the way. So you're now doing the work of an employee to get you, in theory, out of the store faster. And the thought was, this is going to eliminate lines and get you out faster. Well, now the lines for self-checkout are obviously longer than lines for traditional checkout ever were. The mother f- machines never work. Never work. <laughs> help is on the way. No, no help is on the way. And when the help shows up for a problem that you didn't cause, a problem that you didn't cause, the person who does show up five minutes later looks like they'd rather be machine gunned to death than have to fix the same problem on the same machine that they've done a hundred more times already today. Why can't we just go back? to the old school way, or at least put more cashiers on the floor so that I don't have to go through this torture so that every memory I have of doing business with you, Mr. or Mrs. Grocer, is how much I hated trying to leave your business. Or if I'm going to do self-checkout, give me a discount, right? If I'm saving you money, pass the savings on to me. Otherwise, it's a failed experiment. I hate you, Grocers of America. Get it out of there. Thank you so much for listening. Ken, why do I Following. why do I now desperately see that it's not the employee, it's the machine that grinds you? And also, <laughs> why did I just have a fantasy of us walking through an airport and me going on one lane and you getting on the moving escalator to find out it doesn't work? And I keep going and you stay right there and you've got to back up or you got to run oh, on there. Thank you for that visual. Yeah, that. that's, that's good. Oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, by the way, folks, if you go outside <laughs> after listening to this, the gentleman sh- sh- shaking his fist and at the clouds will be Ken Schmidt as well. So, uh, um, all right, Jeff, what got your attention? Oh man, so much stuff has got my attention this, uh, this week. I'll tell you the thing though. I'm going to an air supply concert in uh, back in New Hampshire in the middle. Uh, that's all we have uh, for today, folks. So we'll, <laughs> Check, please. <laughs> and I've been visualizing this experience of going to an air supply concert. I'm a, wow. I'm a deadhead. I listen wow. to a lot of all sorts of stuff. And I, I'm doing this for a reason. And so air supply has gotten my attention this week because I have been listening to their entire catalog wondering oh did you what was it like for these guys in the studio how many people had to sign off on this before it happened and then who's going to be at this air supply concert that i'm going to and i started thinking about it and i started thinking gosh this irritates me and it irritates me and the reason it irritates me so much is these guys are really happy they seem to be very joyful guys. They're good at what so they do. So why am I yeah. so upset about that? And then I got to look inside and say, oh, man, why am I laughing at that guy that dropped the ice cream cone? And what do I got to do? So I quickly transitioned from that into what's got my eye this week is a book called Norwegian Wood, Chopping, Stacking, and Drying Wood the Scandinavian Way by an author oh, named no. Lars Mittling. That's L-A-R-S-M-Y-T-T-I-N-G. <laughs> and it's the philosophy of just splitting wood and getting it right. And how personal wow. this can be. And it is the opposite of air supply, man. But I'll tell you, if it wasn't for air supply, I wouldn't have found the inner peace with this chopping wood thing. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> Good job sewing that together. There you go. (laughs) Nice art. Well done. 
All right. So I'm going to, I had two, but I'm going to put one aside and save it for another one. I, I just have to tease it though, Ken, because this one is coming, which is a, which is a column that was just written. I want to re, I want to read the author's uh, book as well, but the column is why is swearing so much fun? Going to move that aside though, because I'm a firm believer. I mean, so this is already like validating my life belief and practice, but I do want to talk about customer experience. And what, what comes to me is I just had nothing but an insane moment of joy. One, I've talked about these guys in the past. One of my favorite websites, period. And I've written a column about them in a, a publication a long time ago. One of my favorite uh, sites out there was called Woot.com, W-O-O-T.com. And Woot began its life on the web simply as throwing up one item a day. Typically, they were buying overstock and they would just put it up there and you had one day to go ahead and buy it until it was sold out. The best thing about Woot was the writing. I would go to Woot every day because what they would do is they would take an item that you were like, this is already out of date, or this was like, they've already gone to version three, or I don't think I need a 20 foot long fluorescent <laughs> array. Like all of this stuff that was pointless. And they would write like, we know this is garbage. We know you don't want this. And you're a more sophisticated person, but come on, this is cheap. And so they would play and Woot famously even went forward and developed something that when it comes online and they still do it, they've been purchased by Amazon, but when they still do it. It's a marvel. And guys like me scramble. They just have on their website, a brown paper bag, and it's called the bag of crap. And basically what it is, is you don't know what it is. And it's all of their stuff. And famously, people have will put up, you go to Pinterest and such, and people will show what their bag of crap had. One guy got a television, a 55-inch plasma screen, because one was left, and that was the bag of crap for him. But basically, this is, so you get what Woot is all about. Amazon bought them, they expanded it, but it's still really funny. So I went ahead and purchased a, uh, my particular iPhone model is no longer going to be made. So apparently, they bought a bunch of stuff from Apple, and it's very expensive iPhone leather mag uh, uh, charging case was available. Ooh, ah. So I bought it. I bought it for 12 or 15 bucks. Well, all of a sudden I get an email from Woot. I got the package, but then I got this and I have to read it. And it was, Dear Martin, haveth thy noticed that? Wow, that's hard to do. How did Shakespeare manage it? Look, let's skip all the flowery corporate talk and get right to the point. You're getting some money back today. That's right. Hooray. The long version is that you recently bought the Apple 12 mini leather MagSafe, blah, blah, blah. And after that, we dropped the price. And that's not fair to you, is it? Uh, we would have waited if only you knew. And we agree. And that's why we're making it right. You'll be seeing a $3 per quantity ordered on your credit card very soon. We're sorry for the hassle, but we think you might forgive us this once, right? After all, you just scored an even better deal than you were expecting. Welp, that about covers us. Uh, covers it. If you have any questions regarding the above, please, con please contact us at support.woot. And then they end it with Pretty V, Anon, Adieu, Verona, your sweet admirers at Woot.com. Well done. <laughs> and I, well done. So this is, right? This is, these are a bunch of folks in Texas in a massive warehouse. Amazon bought them. And so these guys basically, this is their customer engagement. This is how they do their work. I then wrote them back how honored I was, how <laughs> pleased I was. And if they could do it, could I just take the credit and buy another phone case? And then they told me, sadly, they're all gone. We're really sorry. I have not had so much joy from some Fantastic. faceless e-commerce site out there. So in our world where we're looking for all this stuff, I would point everybody to go to woot.com every day. The problem is you will start buying tons of stuff you don't need and they know it, but you will have more fun than ever. And you might wind up with a customer service experience like I just had. So um, Th thus proving that an e-business can do that. And thus yes. also solving the mystery of where uh, Jeff's air supply greatest hit CD came from. <laughs> They're all the hits. That's the problem. They're all equally and good. <laughs> <laughs> and, on, and on that note, as we end with Ken now saying thus, thus a lot. Huh? So uh, everyone, thanks so much. Jeff DeVito, it was a real pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for sharing the information. Amen. It was great 
Uh, Ken, as always, a joy and a pleasure to see you here. Folks, thanks for joining us. Uh, as always, we thank Kate Hickson at Hickson Design for her work with us. Uh, you're going out on the music from Devin Davis. You can find Devin's information at devindaviswebsite.com. And we'll be back to be talking. We're going to run about a three-show arc on experience, customer experience, and what all of that means. So thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you next time. I'm all out of love. I'm so I'm lost, so lost without, without you. Sending two tickets your way, boys. <laughs> God. Hell to the no.